gender bias. We all know that it exists in the workplace, in sports, in how we raise our children, how we educate our students, and how we interact with one another. I'm here today to show you that gender bias also exists in healthcare and why that matters. According to a 2019 Danish study for men and women of similar ages, it takes women four years longer to be diagnosed with the same chronic medical illness as men. And for a cancer diagnosis, this delay is two years longer for women as it is for men. And this delay, think about it, the physical costs are enormous. Diabetes, stroke, cancer, and heart attacks are all underdiagnosed and undertreated in women. Women are twice as likely to be women are twice as likely as men to die in the year following a heart attack. Twice as likely. Really take that in. Gender bias is affecting the capacity for physicians and other healthcare practitioners to truly hear and believe their women patients. This is particularly true when it comes to pain. Let me tell you the story that a patient of mine shared with me about her husband's visit to the emergency room. He was having pain when he urinated. He was diagnosed with a bladder infection. Most women in the audience know that a UTI can hurt, but we also know that it's typically treated by picking up an antibiotic on the way home from the doctor's office. <laughs> well, my patient's husband, however, was admitted to the hospital for antibiotics and pain control with morphine. <laughs> and when she questioned the practitioner, he said, well, this kind of thing really hurts for men. <laughs> I know. So the stereotype that men are tough and women are emotional is really clouding the judgment of both female and male healthcare practitioners, as well as others in healthcare. Um, when men are overtreated for pain, they're at risk inadvertently for substance misuse, while at the same time, Doctors often minimize or dismiss a woman's pain. If she's stoic and doesn't show her pain, then she's not believed. If she shows her pain, then she's emotional or exaggerating. Let me give you another example. After coronary artery bypass surgery, when men complain of pain, they receive pain medication, which is appropriate. Studies show that when women complain of pain, they're more likely to receive sedatives. That's right, sedatives. That was a disturbing finding for me, as it should be for all of you. The belief that women are overly emotional when it comes to pain dates back to ancient Greece, when the uterus was thought to be the root of all hysteria. And since only women have a uterus, it was thought that only women suffered from the condition of hysteria. In Greek, the term for uterus is hysterica. I probably didn't pronounce that right. But 
The other term that's important is when you perform a surgery to remove that offending organ, it's called hysterectomy. The belief that women are overly emotional causes them to not be believed when they are in pain. And this is offensive, to say the least. But the result of this is far more extensive for women. I'd like to take you into my exam room. I've been a board-certified gynecologist for over 15 years, and I take care of women with chronic pelvic pain. One of the conditions that I treat is painful sex, a common but often ignored problem. Think about mustering up the courage to go in and talk to your doctor about having painful sex. Well, you hold off on making that call for a while, hoping it's just going to go away on its own, but it doesn't. And so you make that call, and you go in and you see her. You have an exam. She doesn't find anything. And she orders an ultrasound just to be safe. So you have the test done, and you wait for the result. And her nurse calls a few days later. Good news. Your ultrasound was negative. Have a great day. So despite that reassurance, you know that something's wrong. Sex is still hurting. It's not happening as often as it used to because of that pain. And intimacy is suffering because it just leads to pain. Another year goes by, still having that same old pain, but now your bladder is acting up. You're peeing more frequently. Urgency, leaking. This kind of thing has never happened to you before. So you go back in and see your doctor. Tell her, hey, that painful sex thing is still there. And now my bladder is acting up. She does an exam. Doesn't find anything, does a urinalysis. Sends that off for a culture. And you wait for those results. You get put on some antibiotics just to be safe. A few days, the nurse calls. Good news. You don't have an infection. Have a great day. Sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> what now? That pain is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. You're not having sex anymore because it hurts still. Your relationship has suffered. And so you know your body. You know there's something wrong, even though your doctor doesn't think so. So you see more doctors. Tell them about your painful sex, bladder acting up, etc. And then you're told, well, maybe you don't love your husband anymore. Maybe that's why you're having pain. Have you thought about that? Well, you've seen all these doctors. They've run all these tests. Nothing's wrong. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe that's what it is, and we can give you a pill for that. How about just push through it? Or have some wine, relax, and then have sex. <laughs> All true stories. So you've been to six different doctors. You've been on the phone making appointments. You've been in waiting rooms, exam rooms, poked and prodded, had numerous testing done all to just have your pain dismissed. And now you're wondering, is it all in my head? So you give up. And this woman may go on to never have the children that she intended to have, to not have a partner, to develop depression, The most important thing that I do with my patients is that I believe them. Thank you. That goes a long way in reducing the emotional suffering that a woman goes through. And it also improves the accuracy of a diagnosis. 
and the timeliness of treatment. Collectively, we must do better by the women in our lives. To my colleagues, I'd like you to recall back to why you went into medicine. And it wasn't just to see as many patients in a day as the institutions tell us we need to do. It was about helping women and men find the answers. If a woman is not believed, she doesn't get her answers. She doesn't get better. And so I ask of you, to take the time to listen, believe, and help our patients find their answers. And to the rest of us, especially the women in the audience, it's so important to be your own advocate. Educate yourself, create logs, bring that information with you when you see your provider. But most importantly, don't stop. If you don't feel that you're being taken seriously, Please go on and find another provider. We all must do better for the patients in our lives, the women in our lives. We must listen and listen to our true calling. Thank you. Colleen, thank you. Uh, powerful, powerful topic. I want to ask you about the current medical school curriculum. I'm presuming the doctors are not uh, teaching this in school, but is there a movement to change that? And if so, what progress uh, are schools making? The short answer is no. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, but there have been some universities who have taken up this cause and institutionalized training about gender bias. I mean, that's the, the thing. If you don't recognize it exists, then you're not going to recognize that actually you're part of the problem. So there are a few universities that are. There is a groundswell of effort right now to make that happen, but it's really going to have to infiltrate all the way through the education process, not just physicians, also nurse practitioners, physician assistants. I don't mean to pick on just doctors here. Um, it's all of us. We, you know, bias is oftentimes uh, implicit, and we don't recognize that it's there. All right. So we have a lot of work to do. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.